Before we can talk about the American Revolution and our fight for independence against the tyrant King George III, or even mention the creation of the Constitution, it's important to understand the 13 colonies and the origins of our nation. So what is a colony anyway? We're going to hear this term a lot. A colony is land that's under the political control of another country and occupied by settlers of that country. Another term you're going to hear a lot of is the term colonist. This just means a settler of the colony. And many of the colonists considered themselves to be British subjects, even though they didn't all come from the UK. The 13 colonies are divided into three regions. Each region's kind of got its own personality, its own way of doing things, of making money, and even its religious faiths. All of these differences between the regions are what we need to learn for this unit. The three regions are New England, Middle, and Southern colonies. So let's take a closer look. And we're gonna start with New England first because they're the ones that would probably protest the loudest for going last. There are four colonies that make up New England, and those are Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. With the colony of Massachusetts being one of the first establishments of UK settlers, and of course I'm talking about the Pilgrims on the Mayflower, the New England colonies had a really rough climate. They had harsh winters and freezing temperatures, and really mild summers and a shorter growing season. We know this from the story of the Pilgrims, right? They really struggled to survive in the beginning because they had rocky soil that was not great for farming. Corn was one of the few things that they actually could produce out of the soil in New England. But what they lacked in soil, they made up for in their vast timber resources. Believe it or not, this was one of the most in-demand items from the UK. The New England region also had lots of coastlines and harbors, which made it great for fishing and shipping. Speaking of which, Coastlines and harbors were an essential part of the New England economy. Fishing and whaling could be done from those harbors. The timber resources were used for shipbuilding and home building. And seaports kept New England at the heart of the triangular trade. Now if you're not familiar with what that is, New England was part of an international trade across the Atlantic Ocean. Items like molasses and sugarcane were shipped to New England, where they were processed into rum. Lots of other raw materials were shipped across the Atlantic to trade for slaves in West Africa. The triangle would be completed by sending slaves back to the Caribbean, with their ultimate destination being the British colonies. Now, New England also benefited by sending its raw materials like tobacco and timber and cotton all the way to the UK. In return, the UK would send things over that the colonies couldn't make for themselves. Finished products and goods, paint and tea leaves. Religion in the New England colonies was a really big deal. Remember, it was founded by pilgrims. The same pilgrims that left their home country in search of religious freedom. And oh, by the way, half of them died within the first few months of living in the New World. Religion was important to them. So yeah. They were strictly religious, and they punished those that went against their faith. Now there are two kinds of religions we need to learn about in New England, and the first is the Puritan faith. The Puritans had a big problem with the Church of England, and the way that they went about their business. And they felt like they could make a few changes to purify the faith, and make it truly what they thought it should be. On the other hand, the separatists, which, oh, by the way, these are the actual pilgrims that arrived in Plymouth Colony, they wanted to break away completely from the Church of England. They felt like it could not be saved or purified. It just had to be left behind completely and started over from scratch. There are a couple of key people we need to pay attention to in this region. And the first is John Winthrop. And he was the leader and elected governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which was the Puritan stronghold of that area. The other notable person from this area is William Bradford, and he was the governor of Plymouth Colony, the leader of the Separatists, the actual pilgrims on the Mayflower. Bradford plays a very important role historically with his journal and recollection of things that happened in Plymouth Colony, including the story of Thanksgiving. New England's government was an interesting one because when they arrived in the New World, 
there was no government, and they had to decide to establish self-government by signing the Mayflower Compact and making an agreement with one another. This took a lot of discipline. So as you can imagine, the laws and rules of a society full of Puritans and Separatists were very religiously based. All elected officials in this region had to attend church. And that about sums it up for the New England colonies, and we're moving on now to the Middle Colonies. And the Middle Colonies are Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. Now I know what you're thinking. There ain't no way Pennsylvania and New York are in the middle of the country. How can they be called the Middle Colonies? But we're not thinking about Pennsylvania and New York in terms of the country today. We're thinking about them in terms of the 13 colonies. Consider the first two UK establishments in the New World. Jamestown, Virginia and Plymouth Rock, Massachusetts. And directly in between those two establishments lies the Middle Colonies. The geography and climate of the Middle Colonies was slightly different than the New England colonies, featuring cold winters but warmer summers. And that all leads to a longer growing season that was better for producing crops, specifically grains, oats, and wheats. In addition to the longer growing season, the soil itself was better for growing these crops. And the Middle Colonies featured many major river systems that was perfect for sending their goods downstream. The Middle Colony's economy was centered around wheats and oats, which is why they get the nickname of the breadbasket. But in addition to that, they also produced iron from their mines and iron goods for the rest of the colonies. Just like New England, the Middle Colonies also had vast timber resources used for shipbuilding and logging. And of course, the Middle Colonies are well known for their textiles, their factories and manufacturing. As far as religion is concerned, they're nowhere near as strict as their New England neighbors. The Middle Colonies were quite chill when it came to choosing your faith because they had a greater diversity in people and therefore a greater diversity in faith. A major religion we need to know from the region is the Quaker faith and they believed in pacifism, they were against slavery, and they believed in religious freedom. And yes, that's the same guy from Quaker Oats. They also make really good oatmeal. This region also features the Catholics and the Lutherans. It might not seem strange to you today, but back in the time of the 13 colonies, having all these different faiths around in the same region was kind of different, which makes the Middle Colonies unique. A key person from this region is William Penn. He's the founder of the colony of Pennsylvania and personally established the city of Philadelphia. Now, back in England, King Charles II owed his father a lot of money or a lot of debt. And so King Charles II actually William. gifted this land to William Penn for him to use for whatever purposes he wanted. And having left the Church of England and becoming a Quaker himself, he established Pennsylvania as a land for religious freedom. William Penn was also a pacifist and he was big into anti-slavery and making peaceful alliances with the Native Americans in Pennsylvania. Since many of the Middle Colonies were lands granted by the king, lawmakers were elected by the people of the colonies to sort of run the show while the king was away. And New York and New Jersey was completely different. These were royal colonies which were directly under the rule of the king. <laughs> Let's move on now to the final region, which is the Southern Colonies. This includes North Carolina, South Carolina, Maryland, Virginia, and Georgia. The Southern Colonies' geography and climate was very different than the other two regions, featuring very mild winters with hot summers. The soil was also perfect for farming, and the growing season was the longest in all of the colonies. Crops like tobacco and cotton grew exceptionally well here. And, as you might have guessed, the economy was based around this profitable agriculture. Tobacco, cotton, and rice made the colonies very wealthy. However, the southern colonies also relied on slaves to harvest these cash crops. Slaves were purchased as property, and in the southern colonies, they actually outnumbered the free people. Religion in the southern colonies was not as impactful as the other regions. 
With all the massive farms and plantations, it actually spread the people out so that they didn't really congregate as frequently as they did in the larger, denser cities of the Middle and New England colonies. However, the Anglican faith, which is a hybrid of Catholic and Protestant faith, was the most prominent of religions in this region. They were also very tolerant of other religions. Basically everyone was except for New England. As for key people in this region, George Calvert is one of the big ones because he was the first English settlement in Canada. And I know you're saying, dude, I need to learn about key people from the southern colonies, but just hold on to your horses. Calvert experienced his first Canadian winter and said, uh-uh. I gotta get the heck out of here. And he went back to the UK and tried to charter a place with a better climate, which ended up being Maryland. He envisioned this new charter being a refuge for all Catholics from the UK. George Calvert's tale is all kinds of super sad, but basically he dies before the charter is signed. His legacy lives on, however, with the colony of Maryland. Another key person is John Smith. Yes, the John Smith from the story of Pocahontas. He was real, and he helped establish the first English settlement of Jamestown. He was a tough leader, which was needed for Jamestown to survive, but nobody really liked him. He was a terrible liar, and most of his accounts were very exaggerated or even fabricated. The southern colonies elected their own government leaders and even had their own governors to run the colonies. They also had their own courts, to rule on issues in the South. And there you have it. Those are the three regions of the 13 colonies and how different each region was. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks so much for sticking to the end of my video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. We'll make more videos soon.